The Unknown by Guy de Maupassant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Unknown by Guy de Maupassant. We were speaking of adventures, and each one of us was relating his story of delightful experiences, surprising meetings on the train in a hotel at the seashore. According to Roger des Annettes, the seashore was particularly favorable to the little blind god. Gontran, who was keeping mum, was asked what he thought of it. I guess Paris is about the best place for that, he said. Woman is like a precious trinket. We appreciate her all the more when we meet her in the most unexpected places. But the rarest ones are only to be found in Paris. He was silent for a moment and then continued. By Jove, it's great. Walk along the streets on some spring morning. The little women, daintily tripping along, seem to blossom out like flowers. What a delightful, charming sight. The dainty perfume of violet is everywhere. The city is gay, and everybody notices the women. By Jove, how tempting they are in their light, thin dresses, which occasionally give one a glimpse of the delicate pink flesh beneath. One saunters along, head up, mind alert, and eyes open. I tell you, it's great. You see her in the distance, while still a block away. You already know that she's going to please you at close quarters. You can recognize her by the flower on her hat, the toss of her head or her gait. She approaches, and you say to yourself, Look out, here she is. You come closer to her, and you devour her with your eyes. Is it a young girl running errands for some store? A young woman returning from church or hastening to see her lover? What do you care? Her well-rounded bosom shows through the thin waist. Oh, if you could only take her in your arms and fondle and kiss her. Her glance may be timid or bold, her hair light or dark. What difference does it make? She brushes against you, and a cold shiver runs down your spine. Ah, how you wish for her all day. How many of these dear creatures have I met this way, and how wildly in love I would have been had I known them more intimately. Have you noticed that the ones we love the most distractedly are those whom we never meet to know? Curious, isn't it? From time to time we barely catch a glimpse of some woman, the mere sight of whom thrills our senses. But it goes no further. When I think of all the adorable creatures that I have elbowed in the streets of Paris, I fairly rave. Who are they? Where are they? Where can I find them again? There is a proverb which says that happiness often passes our way. I am sure that I often passed alongside the one who could have caught me like a linnet in the snare of a fresh beauty. Roger des Annettes had listened smilingly. He answered, I know that as well as you do. This is what happened to me. About five years ago, for the first time, I met on the Pont de la Concorde, a young woman who made a wonderful impression on me. She was dark, rather stout, with glossy hair and eyebrows which nearly met above her two dark eyes. On her lip was a scarcely perceptible down, which made one dream. Dream as one dreams of beloved woods, on seeing a bunch of wild violets. She had a small waist and a well-developed bust which seemed to present a challenge, offer a temptation. Her eyes were like two black spots on white enamel. Her glance was strange, vacant, unthinking, and yet wonderfully beautiful. I imagined that she might be a Jewess. I followed her and then turned round to look at her as did many others. She walked with a swinging gait that was not graceful, but somehow attracted one. At the Place de la Concorde, she took a carriage, and I stood there like a fool, moved by the strongest desire that had ever assailed me. For about three weeks I thought only of her, and then a memory passed out of my mind. Six months later, I described her in the Rue de la Paix again. On seeing her, I felt the same shock that one experiences on seeing a once dearly loved woman. I stopped that I might better observe her. When she passed close enough to touch me, I felt as though I was standing before a red-hot furnace. Then, when she had passed by, I noticed a delicious sensation, as of a cooling breeze blowing over my face. I did not follow her. I was afraid of doing something foolish. I was afraid of myself. She haunted all my dreams. It was a year before I saw her again. But just as the sun was going down on one beautiful evening in May, I recognized her walking along the Avenue de Champs-Élysées. The Arc de Triomphe stood out in bold relief against the fiery glow of the sky. A golden haze filled the air. It was one of those delightful spring evenings which are the glory of Paris. 
I followed her, tormented by a desire to address her, to kneel before her, to pour forth the emotion which was choking me. Twice I passed by her only to fall back, and each time as I passed by I felt the sensation, as of scorching heat, which I had noticed in the Rue de la Paille. She glanced at me, and then I saw her enter a house on the Rue de Prébourg. I waited for her two hours, and she did not come out. Then I decided to question the janitor. He seemed not to understand me. She must be visiting someone, he said. The next time I was eight months without seeing her, but one freezing morning in January, I was walking along the boulevard Malchebre at a dog trot so as to keep warm, when at the corner I bumped into a woman and knocked a small package out of her hand. I tried to apologize. It was she. At first I stood stock still from the shock. Then having returned to her the package which she had dropped, I said abruptly, I am both grieved and delighted, madame, to have jostled you. For more than two years I have known you, admired you, and had the most ardent wish to be presented to you. Nevertheless, I have been unable to find out who you are or where you live. Please excuse these foolish words. Attribute them to a passionate desire to be numbered among your acquaintances. Such sentiments can surely offend you in no way. You do not know me. My name is Baron Roger des Annettes. Make inquiries about me, and you will find that I am a gentleman. Now, if you refuse my request, you will throw me into abject misery. Please be good to me and tell me how I can see you. She looked at me with her strange vacant stare and answered smilingly, Give me your address. I will come and see you. I was so dumbfounded that I must have shown my surprise. But I quickly gathered my wits together and gave her a visiting card, which she slipped into her pocket with a quick deft movement. Becoming bolder, I stammered, When shall I see you again? She hesitated as though mentally running over her list of engagements and then murmured, Will Sunday morning suit you? I should say it would. She went on after having stared at me, judged, weighed and analyzed me with this heavy and vacant gaze which seemed to leave a quieting and deadening impression on the person towards whom it was directed. Until Sunday my mind was occupied day and night trying to guess who she might be and planning my course of conduct towards her. I finally decided to buy her a jewel, a beautiful little jewel, which I placed in its box on the mantelpiece and left it there awaiting her arrival. I spent a restless night waiting for her. At ten o'clock she came, calm and quiet, and with her hand outstretched as though she had known me for years. Drawing up a chair, I took her hat and coat and furs and laid them aside, and then timidly I took her hand in mine, and after that all went on without a hitch. Ah, my friends! What a bliss it is to stand at a discreet distance and watch the hidden pink and blue ribbons partly concealed, to observe the hazy lines of the beloved one's form as they become visible through the last of the filmy garments. What a delight it is to watch the ostrich-like modesty of those who are in reality none too modest, and what is so pretty as their motions. Her back was turned towards me, and suddenly my eyes were irresistibly drawn to a large black spot right between her shoulders. What could it be? Were my eyes deceiving me? But no, there it was staring me in the face. Then my mind reverted to the faint down on her lip, the heavy eyebrows almost meeting over her cold black eyes, her glossy black hair. I should have been prepared for some surprise. Nevertheless, I was dumbfounded, and my mind was haunted by dim visions of strange adventures. I seemed to see before me one of the evil Jenny of the Thousand and One Nights, one of these dangerous and crafty creatures whose mission it is to drag me down to unknown depths. I thought of Solomon, who made the Queen of Sheba walk on a mirror that he might be sure that her feet were not cloven. And when the time came for me to sing of love to her, my voice forsook me. At first she showed surprise, which soon turned to anger, and she said quickly, putting on her wraps, It was hardly worthwhile for me to go out of my way to come here. I wanted her to accept the ring which I had bought for her, but she replied haughtily, For whom do you take me, sir? I blushed to the roots of my hair. She left without saying another word. There is my whole adventure, but the worst part of it is that I am now madly in love with her. I can't see a woman without thinking of her. All the others disgust me, unless they remind me of her. I cannot kiss a woman without seeing her face before me and without suffering the torture of unsatisfied desire. She's always with me, always there, dressed or nude, my true love. 
She is there beside the other one, visible but intangible. I am almost willing to believe that she was bewitched and carried a talisman between her shoulders. Who is she? I don't know yet. I have met her once or twice since. I bowed, but she pretended not to recognize me. Who is she? An oriental? Yes, doubtless an oriental Jewess. I believe that she must be a Jewess. But why? Why? I don't know. End of The Unknown by Guy de Maupassant